So I'm going to tell the story of a couple of dudes that wanted to start a design company uh, that have no idea what they're doing and like it that way. Uh, this is me on the left in Virginia in 1988, uh, wearing this cute Oshkosh Pagosh outfit, green corduroy, looking at the camera. I had no idea what I was doing at the time, but my mom certainly did. Uh, this is what would eventually become my best friend in the world, Jeff Franklin, wearing the same exact outfit <laughs> in the same exact pose uh, in a different state in West Virginia. Uh, a couple years later, uh, my uncle, who was an artist, gave me a book on the artist Keith Haring. And in this book, it was a story of a man who believed that art is for everybody and that art should be fun and that the power of creativity is something so large that could change lives. And it was all through the guise of color and fun and he had built this entire world. And at that time, I knew that I wanted to be able to do something like that. Um, so my mom would give me about $5 a week for allowance and I would go to Michael's and I would buy foam board and I would create buildings from nothing, like you know, that perfect house you have in your mind when you're a kid or something like that, I was a weirdo. And, uh, <laughs> and so I realized that architecture, in my mind, at, in sixth grade, was the vehicle that was going to allow me to build anything at any scale. And I wanted to do that. The power of Keith Haring and a pen and a piece of paper to do anything that you wanted in your head. This was ex extremely important to me. So I decided to go to Virginia Tech Architecture School, where they taught me that design was the culmination of a lot of different things. And it was a tool that allowed you to explore the world in the way that you saw it. Uh, and Virginia Tech taught you to be interested in everything. Um, and this is where I met the curly-haired dude uh, wearing Oshkosh Bagash from West Virginia, and he shared a similar thing. We had nothing in common except for the fact that we were interested in almost everything and that we really wanted to make things happen in this world, and we had no idea how to do it, but we knew that we wanted to. Um, school was incredibly rigorous and tough, um, it, it, very special, uh, but we wanted to get out of the school as much as possible to explore and have conversations, so we would go down to this coffee shop called Bolo's, uh, and we would steal a stack of napkins, and we would draw on them until we filled them with ideas that came out of our head that made no sense. Some of them did. It didn't really matter, but our, our challenge to each other was to make each other laugh, like draw this dude with a beard, draw on a log for money, or we would draw <laughs> what would be our life plan. Archie graduates, Archie moves to Richmond, Jeff moves to Richmond, and eventually ends in a pile of napkins where Jeff dies in NASCAR, which hasn't happened yet because he's sitting here in the audience, um, <laughs> but we were excited about this idea. Uh, also at the time, the library was this incredible place to explore. Uh, and so we found this book by this design company in New York called Carlson Wilker, started by Jan Wilker and Hjalti Carlson. And in this book, they tell the story of a New York design company. But it's not told in the story that you would imagine a design company would run when you're 19 years old and reading about it. It was a story of fun, there was no rule, and at that time we realized there was no structure to how to make things, that we were capable of making whatever we wanted to make. Um, so we had no idea what we were doing, but we knew we wanted to go to New York, start a design company, and do whatever we wanted to do for a living, and so we did. Uh, we both had jobs, uh, but we started an office called Play Lab in the back of this uh, studio. It's like a 150 square foot uh, closet-sized space in Bushwick, Brooklyn. There was a chicken coop behind the other side of the window, so in the summer it smelled real bad, in the winter it was unbearably cold, but it was our little paradise, and we could create anything that we wanted there. No client was asking us to make the things that we wanted to make, so we just made them ourselves. Whether it was a record label, we wanted to create record covers, so we just created a record label from scratch. A lot of weird things happened here. Uh, I won't, I won't go too far into it. Uh, but we keep this image in our heads all the time. So that was in 2007, 2008. Uh, this is the image of Mars. And I read on a comment board in Discover Magazine back in 2008 that uh, this woman was arguing why we should spend money to go to space and explore. And she was defending the point and she said, we never waste time or money when we attempt to understand or explore something. And that resonated huge with me because um, I think it's completely true. And there's nothing that captures it more than, than exploring. Uh, so that's what we did. We built a world around it. We met this guy, Dong Ping Wong. Jeff used to work with him at an architecture office called Rex. And he's from San Diego. He's an incredible dude that has a similar sentiment to us in the way that he looks at the world. Um, he talked about the story of the river. He grew up on water in New York, uh, he grew up in water in San Diego and he surfed all the time. But when he moved to New York, it took him six or seven years to realize that you're not even allowed to swim in the river that surrounds the island of Manhattan uh, because it's fairly polluted. Um, and <laughs> see, you know. Um, but he called it a strange border 
that existed between the two boroughs of Brooklyn and Manhattan. And we thought that was pretty special. And so we started thinking about ways that architecture could actually solve a bit of that problem. And then if you look back in time, you see that as, as late as the late 1800s and as, as recent as 1937, there were 14 floating bathhouses around the tip of Manhattan alone, which is an incredible thing to imagine. The fact that people in a hot summer day would go down to the riverfront, socialize, and bathe in this water, and it was an incredible experience that the city of New York doesn't even realize for the most part, the residents, that that was a thing that we were used to be able to do. And we thought that that would be a pretty rad thing if we could do it again. Um, this is a map from the Department of Environmental Conser Conservation that, sh that shows you the orange is where you can't swim in New York City, uh, which is all of it. And so the challenge that we had was, how do you cr just create a small bit of it? And if you can create a small bit that is clean enough to swim in, that it could potentially change the entire city's viewpoint on changing the river quality of the, of, of the city. Um, so it was as simple as that. It was how can we just create this one spot, X marks the spot, a little plus sign that made the water better. So we proposed plus pool, which was a, filter, a proposal for a filtering uh, floating pool that would float out into the river and actually filter water at a rate of 100 a uh, million gallons of water every two days. So the pool would act as a giant strainer. So the design of the pool was simple. We realized that if we wanted to get this idea out, the pool had to be for everybody because right now the pool system and the river system, it, th there's not something for everybody. So we designed the pool for everybody. There are four pools, a, a pool for lap swimming, a pool for lounging, a pool for sports, a pool for kids, and we we've stuck them together in the shape of a plus. As simple as that. So you could open it up at any time for free swimming, or you could actually close it off to actually have Olympic size meets. It's Olympic size and length. And we talk, talked about it like a giant strainer, and we tried to make it as clear and as simple as possible as an idea that people could rally around. Again, we had no idea what we were doing. We just knew that we had this vision, and we all believed, the three of us, that this thing should happen. Uh, this is generally what we thought we had to keep out of the pool. Um, wildlife being the biggest uh, organic matter, which I think you probably know what that is. Um, but the hope was that we would be able to have this situation, this powerful moment where flat people are swimming through the river. Um, and we thought this would be pretty special. So we proposed it. We spent four weeks in a room together, bros, eating burritos, drinking lots of coffee, and we made a book, we made a poster, and we sent them to everyone we knew. Uh, within a week, uh, that whole situation had got blown up. We thought we were just gonna shelf the project and kind of sit back and like do some more weird things. But what ended up happening was one of the greatest engineering offices in the world, Arup, this is the principal of the New York office, Craig Koval, called us up. We thought it was a joke, it wasn't. He asked to take us to lunch, he did. He's cracking champagne there because he said, this thing should happen and we're gonna prove for you that it is feasible and that we can do it. And we said, that sounds cool. Uh, <laughs> so we did that. But the first step was to be able to actually test how this thing works. And we're not scientists, we're not water quality experts, but we're willing, we're naive enough to think that we can do it, uh, and we're passionate, and it's just like Keith Haring, it's just started with a piece of paper and a pen, and we knew that we could make it happen. So the first step was launching a Kickstarter campaign in 2011. We wanted to raise 25 grand to test the first bit of the filtration system that we had designed on paper and had no idea how it was totally gonna work. And we raised that in six days, and by the end of that, we had raised $41,000, which was overwhelming for us, not because of the money, but because 1,200 people wanted this to happen, and it was a large, substantial $15 million construction project that this many people wanted to happen. So we did, we tested. We tested at Brooklyn Bridge Park on the end of this pier every day for 10 weeks, three times a day, running water, pumping it in, running it through these succession of uh, filtration materials until you can see it gets a little bit less shit brown, but it's still shit brown. Um, <laughs> and then pump it back out into the river as clean as, you know, better, better than the river quality actually is. It proved a lot for us, but basically, on the worst day scenario, when the CSOs, the combined sewer outfalls, are just spewing sewage at a rate of 76 million gallons a day into the river, we could get it down with that first layer of filtration down to swimmable, almost to swimmable, at 620 of fecal coliform counts. And this was incredibly exciting, not only to us, but to the city and to Arup and everybody that had put so much time and energy into the project which opened this kind of weird waterfall, so to speak, sorry about the pun, of people that were interested in the project. Everybody from Jay-Z who blogged about it to Jeff being on some uh, Chinese news station in New York. Um, 
again, curly-haired Oshkosh Bagosh, you know, still wearing his grandfather's cardigan. Uh, sorry, Jeff. Um, <laughs> have no idea what we're doing, but incredibly excited about it. So all these people started to get together and started to uh, want to be a part of this project in some way and support it. Uh, and then press started to pick it up, and then the news started to spread that this thing was potentially possible, and some weirdos were trying to make it happen. Um, but at that point, we didn't know what to do again. We had to keep moving. So the next step was we had to test that whole thing of filtration, man, the whole thing. And that was going to be a tough thing to do, and it was going to cost, according to Arup, about a quarter million dollars to test it out. So we realized the only way we're going to get that many people to donate $250,000 to test this wild idea is to give them ownership of the project. So we broke the plus into the common component of the project, which is this 4 inch by 12 inch tile. And we allowed people to own a piece of it and actually write their name on it. So this is a plus pull tile. Um, anybody could write their name on it. And the idea was that 70,000 tiles would eventually be on the pool. And if every person bought one for $200 and their name was on it forever and they were actually cleaning the river, that the entire project would be funded front to back. Um, so we launched the project. This is what it would kind of look like with this very sexy rendering. <laughs> we launched it in July of last year, and we raised $273,000 in 30 days. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so people all over the world bought these tiles, all over the world putting their names on the pool, wanting to be a part of it, which is an incredibly special experience, from babies to families to anybody and everybody. Um, and so now we're at this point that on Tuesday, we head back to New York this afternoon. We're going to be launching a 35-foot version of Plus Pool in the Hudson River, at Hudson River Park, at the end of Pier 40. And we'll be testing for six months. And at the end of that, we will know exactly how to clean the river and for people to swim in it. It started with a sketch on a napkin, and it ended up becoming Time Magazine's top 25 inventions in 2013. Um, I just want to leave you with... Uh, I just want to leave you with one thing. Uh, a man named Carl Sagan, a scientist, in 1977, and his wife Anne worked with NASA to launch the Voyager space probe in outer space. They wanted to leave a sign of humanity. They wanted to leave um, the sounds and the images of Earth so that if anybody ever found it, uh, that they would know that humanity existed. Now, that's a wild concept. You never know what life is out there. Uh, but the whole point was that he called it a message in a bottle into the cosmic ocean, and that exploring is always worth it. Thank you.